from our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Welcome everybody to this CUBE Conversation. My name is Dave Vellante and we're here in our Palo Alto studios. Mudu Sadakar is here. He's an investor, an entrepreneur, and a friend. Mudu, great to see you again. Thanks so much for coming yeah, in. Yeah, thank you it's for having me. It's been too long since it is. you and I sat down and had a conversation on theCUBE, so welcome It's been welcome two back. years, a year. <laughs> yeah, At well, least. you've been on theCUBE a bunch and you've, I've seen some great conversations that you've had with, with, with Peter and, and, and John, John, so thanks for making the time and coming back in. Thank you. David. So, I want to start with, when I go around and talk to, to executives, Every CEO is trying to get digital right. You know, whatever that means. You know, they know it's important and they're trying to figure it out. They know it relates to data. They know they have to leverage data. They know this buzzword of digital transformation. What are you seeing when you talk to, to executives and companies? How, how real is this digital transformation? Is it a fad or is it a sub substantive? Yeah, good question. So look, from my viewpoint of view, digital transformation is a word people use, but at the end of the day, CIOs have to disrupt their businesses. Every CIO has to figure out, am I cutting the cost? Am I helping companies grow in revenue? From a look at from a board perspective and what people are looking at, an investor perspective, most CIOs are, CIOs are looking at somehow looking, running their operations on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, to that point, I think most CEOs are expecting CIOs to do the new innovative things. Uh, I, you're probably hearing that people are adding CDO as a title. Yeah. So it's up to CIO to see, will he be the innovative CIO? It's like you have two kids, like in your case you have four kids. You have to, how do you make sure that all four kids are given the equal responsibility? So CIO has to decide, look, I have budget X, X by two goes to my existing business, X by two goes to the new business. That decision making is not happening with the CIOs today. And that's where the digital transformation has to be, is going on in a, what I call, not in a disruptive manner. But the CIOs who have figured out how to disrupt it, are really taking to the next stage. The next thing that people are interested there is, where do I start, right? Mm. I have all, should I start with my CRM, supply chain, should I start with my IT? You got to figure out what are there. But start someplace, you pick one area, but that has to be disruptive in the sense, we are living in the age of, where I call it autonomous everything, right? There's a data, there is cloud, and there's AI, or machine learning, whatever you want. These three are such a large disruption in our industry. CAOs have to figure out and say, what can I do in terms of cost saving in terms of revenue growth, but that can't be incremental, it has to be revolutionary. So I often say with, for decades we've marched to the cadence of Moore's Law in this industry, that's where innovation came from, no longer. It's, as you said, it's data. Now for the last 10 years, and you were involved in this, we were collecting all this data, we lowered the cost of collecting data and, right. and, and, and running data warehouses with Hadoop, but now data's plentiful, insights aren't. So you have data, you have to apply machine intelligence to that data and then cloud gives you scale. So that's like the new innovation cocktail. So you agree that digital, or I agree, digital transformation is real. Right. And, and the other dynamic, Mudu, is you see companies are, because it's data, are able to traverse industries. It used to be you're in an industry. If you're in financial services, that's it. Right. If you're in healthcare, that's it. Now you see Amazon's in content, Apple's into financial services. So people are afraid of getting disrupted. You've got this new innovation cocktail. So your point was, where do you get started? So you've got to shift resources. You, you don't have unlimited budget. Right. So how do people do that? How are they taking cost out of their business and how are they reapportioning that cost for innovation? Uh, very good, so I, I'll give you two examples from my, again, again, thinking of where I see it. One is for CIOs has something called IT operations. Mm -hmm. IT operation is a very big piece that people need to figure out how to get the cost out of it. The IT operations cannot be there when we've been running IT for the last 30 years. I mean, whatever the word they use, I know Gartner uses the word called AI ops. I don't care what the word is, but the key is you have to run your IT in autonomous manner. We are living in the age of your trading is autonomous. Your, my, your 401k and my 401k are being traded through hedge funds. Your ad technology is autonomous with Facebook, Google, and Amazon with our data. When I saw with, with Caspid and Splunk, we made cybersecurity autonomous to, to whatever extent threat detection, but when it came to IT operations and IT customer support, today it's still manual. If I'm a CEO right now, I'll invest on customer service and support to start as a point of what can I do to make my service agents better, or what can I do to make the end users or the users experience better without going to a human. Can I eliminate the human in the equation here? The mileage may vary. It's like the driverless concept. It's you have level one to level five. They may like to do have autopilot. Some people may have a fully autonomous car. Depending on the organization, you got to have a d right amount of autonomousity in your organization, both for IT operations and IT service management. That hasn't happened. 
and that will be happening in the next four or five years. So let's talk about that because you were at ServiceNow for a period of time. They've obviously disrupted the old line help desk and you know, they really did a, did a job on, on BMC and Hewlett Packard, et cetera. Um, are they in a position to take that next step? I mean, when you go to ServiceNow Knowledge, you hear folks talk about AI and infusing AI. Obviously there's a lot of data being collected. Um, is that the right model? I mean, they've, they've automated forms, but you, I think you're talking about something more. Uh, help us understand that. Sure, so look, ServiceNow is in a great position. They'll continue to do well. It's a great company, right? I think what's going to happen next is, how can companies like ServiceNow take it to the next stage, mm -hmm. right? Either become a partner with ServiceNow or ServiceNow itself will do it, or there'll be new companies will be formed. Mm -hmm. One angle is, first is enterprises. Is this game going to be for enterprises? Same playbook as a playbook for the cloud. So imagine an app that are born on the cloud. Their IT operations data, their ticketing data, where will that go to? That needs to be think through. Enterprise data, which is enterprise apps and services, they need to figure out. So if I am a company today, if I am Dave Inc., I need to decide, what will I do for my enterprise applications and services? What will I do for my cloud application services? So that's the decision you have to make it at the top. Once it goes down to the next level, then you have to decide, is it for IT support, customer support, or IT operations? What can I do in terms of augmenting there? If I do is just to make my agents better, you can't take the cost out of the equation. The cost should be is, can I automate to the point I can eliminate 50% of my DevOps, 50% of my SREs. My role of the thumb is, in the next four or five years, at least 70, 80% of DevOps, IT, and SRE jobs will be gone. That should be automated. It should be driverless IT, autonomous IT. People should have a, that's not even a moonshot goal. We all in America, let's make great, America great again. This is our time, it's IT, if you don't do it, some other country will do it. Shanghai so, is going to eat us for lunch. So he basically putting forth the scenario where DevOps was essentially a stepping stone and you see that largely going away. It has to be, it has to be automated. I'm not going to hire hundreds of tuners, I call them manual tuners, right? Yes, I'll need some DevOps people. I need some IT admin. Things that system cannot do it algorithmically should go to humans at some point. But there are enough things like, if you want to install something in your laptop, why should I talk to somebody else? If I want to upgrade to Microsoft Office, if I want to buy a CRM license, if I want to get a Zoom provisioning, why do I need to talk to a human being in this equation? Mm. Can I automate that? Complete autonomous, can I get to a level five autonomous in IT? Right, that's what I'm looking Does for. Does robotic process automation play a role here? Can R RPA, we've done some, some events with Automation Anywhere and UiPath, you're seeing huge valuations. UiPath supposedly has another $6 billion valuation. I mean, you know, amazing, Un Unicorn plus, plus, plus. Um, can those technologies be applied to solve this problem? Yes and no. I think it depends on what the, uh, each RPA vendors are doing. RPA is a great topic, right? Mm -hmm. RPA vendors are very successful. What I'm talking about is uh, IT operations and IT support and customer support automation. Can RPA guys take their technology, their subset and apply for it? Sure, they can try it. But these are all have to be grow organically. Doing this in, in IT, doing for customer service and support, doing it for the cloud has its own its own skin, its own platform. Like you and me were talking earlier, if I'm doing this thing on Amazon, why wait and launch a VM? I won't even do it. Like if a new ticket comes in, I should be doing through Kinesis, I should be doing through my Lambda functions. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be, my cost of goods will be so much that I won't, it should not cost me anything until the point Dave generates a ticket to me. First of all, why should Dave generate a ticket? Right, look at the very much extreme model of the Teslas. Tesla car today tells me when should I service my car? Why should you do the same thing? Like I should be coming and tell you, your SharePoint is going to go down, Dave, today. Your Cube application cannot do an interview with me today, unless you fix it. That is what the world wants to go. So, back to service management for a minute. So, in, in the old days of service management, it was too cumbersome, it really didn't have a single CMDB. Uh, it just really didn't work that well. Uh, it didn't right. change anything. Um, <laughs> a lot of tickets is what it did. ServiceNow obviously solved that, that that problem, but what, you, what I'm inferring from what you're saying is it's still too expensive, the entire infrastructure. It needs to be more streamlined, and automation is the answer. Absolutely, so I think if you take it at layers and layers, the first is in the support, starting even from CMDB. Most organizations say my CMD data is still old, or stale, or it's never accurate. Mm -hmm. How can I get a dynamic view of Dave's ink, right? Mm -hmm. I should know when, and that has to be done at the level of services and apps and at Kubernetes level to container level. Once I have a blueprint of what my organization is, then I need to know how do I handle the tickets against it. Then can I do a health monitoring for all my CIs, right? I should be telling you outage predict. At the end of the day, what business care is, is my business running correctly? Do I have a downtime? 
mm. what is going to happen even though if i am false positive few times people are expecting saying that tell me proactively what services will impact and who will be impacted so i can take a corrective action and that will happen starting from cmdb automation i actually call it cloud cmdb or dynamic cmdb in the world of cloud and dynamic let's make a good cmdb which is dynamic and accurate then take it to the all the way to outage prediction right if i can give you a business uptime and outage prediction that would be nirvana if, are you telling me that it cannot solve it you and me are seeing in palo alto a driverless cars are going around we are going to see it in our lifetime it can be so complex that a car can be autonomous but it cannot be mm. I don't buy that. Well, I mean, you, you hear about, oh, the, the systems are down, or my systems are slow today. That's, that's a form of outage. That costs Fortune 2000 companies money. I mean, it's, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a minute yes, in, yes. In, in some cases. So the, and, and I, I think sometimes people aren't aware as to how much, uh, how much revenue is lost to downtime or lost productivity. So there's huge, huge gains to be made there. Um, and it seems that the cloud is the platform on which you're going to you're going to build these these it's new. It's natural apps. choice. It has to be. Yeah. And, and it has to be multi-cloud too. You can't say we are in the age. If you are a new new cloud, you are building it. I tell people build it as a multi-cloud. Your same code should work on GCP, Amazon, and Azure, right? And on VMware if you want to do a private cloud. But it should be same. The same code base should be able to compile and run on all multiple platforms. So, so Kubernetes, microservices. That's the so the, the enabler there, right. right? Right at once, run it. Anywhere, interesting conversation. Multi-cloud. You're hearing a lot of discussion. You know, certainly um, in DC, the Jedi case, Oracle's right. contesting that. When you read the rulings from the General Accounting Office, that basically the the DoD determined that multi-cloud is is less secure, more expensive, more complex. Now that's the DoD. Everybody's going to have multi-cloud because multi-cloud it's multi-vendor. Sure. Um, but, but it's interesting. You don't hear Amazon talking about multi-cloud, um, other than you don't want to do it because it's too expensive. Um, but everybody else is talking about multi-cloud. Is Kubernetes somewhat of a threat to, to to that Amazon posture? I don't think. I think if you look at it, Amazon is saying it, they call it hybrid cloud. The word may be different, multi-cloud or hybrid cloud. Yeah. So they've already partnered with like the best public cloud partnered with the best private yeah, cloud. Yeah, Outpost is an right. awesome announcement. Right, yeah. so VMware, so whenever I talk to Pat Galsinger and his team, I'm like, yeah. they got VMware working with uh, AWS, vice versa, so that's a great, I mean, maybe you can call it a two ecosystem, but they got that whole thing working there. Yeah. Same thing with Azure is going to do with their public cloud on Azure, with Azure, Azure on, stack. On Azure yeah. stack on-prem, yep. right? So everybody, the same thing, GCP will figure out, so then after a while, if you and me as a customer, I should be able to move things Many times it happens, I'm not going to move things dynamically for anybody, but if I want, I don't want a vendor lock-in. I want a code such that if tomorrow something happens, I should be able to have an option to move my code base to a different cloud. And that's where multi-cloud will happen as a requirement as you build it. How much you exercise or not, people will design software going for, for multi-cloud. So it's a whole new vector of conversation. I would love to get your opinion on that multi-cloud opportunity. Obviously Cisco's going after it. VMware is in a really strong position there. Certainly, uh, Microsoft uh, is is vying for that. You have a ton of startups looking at this. IBM with the Red Hat acquisition now is in a in a pretty strong position, you know, given its open source chops. How do you see that whole multi-cloud, you know, vendor landscape shaking out? I think I uh, very good. I'll, I have a theory for this. At the end, when the dust settles, you won't have hundred aircraft carriers. You'll have only four or five. Yeah. So it's like what happened in nineties. Compact went away. Deck went away. So same thing is going to happen here. There will be four or five vendors will survive. There will be Amazons, Azures, maybe GCPs, VMware, maybe it's Cisco and IBM. That's about it. I mean, they're like maybe Ali Cloud in China. Mm -hmm. it, you won't have hundreds of cloud. So the number is already decreasing it. Will it be ten? Will it be five? Will it be four? That's it. You will see with our eyes. But it's already been ha the whole consolidation happening. So if I'm a customer, if I'm a vendor, if I'm a startup or a public company. I'm going to build it only for few these multi-cloud vendors. I'm not going to across 100. Yeah, because the the marginal economics of those those hyperclouds. We've been saying this for years. It, there's just so much more compelling. And, and right. at the end of the day, if the economics are 10x less expensive and more attractive, that they're going to win. You know, and right. and I think even though you have thousands and thousands of service providers who call themselves cloud, we're talking about a different kind of cloud. Right. It's kind of one of those that you know it when you see it types of things. And I'm going to add something. So if you take this back to your earlier question about where the disruption is happening. We talked about all the customer service support and IT service management industry, but imagine if an app is born on the cloud, call yeah. it cloud native applications. Mm -hmm. You have millions of new apps that are there on these cloud platforms. 
what is that going to do? Where is their data going there? They want another customer service and support opinion on their platform. It can't leave, it's like, I'm in your house, I'm drinking your wine, but when it comes to managing my customers of an operation, I will take your log data, your event data, your ticket data and put it in somebody else's house. Even though John is your partner, would you put it there? It doesn't make sense, you should run it inside your. So all these vendors would want a native application that is running on their platform, solving their customer data, which hasn't happened yet. Well, this is interesting. So obviously Oracle has its own cloud, um, you, but you're seeing, well, so you see Workday, uh, Salesforce, ServiceNow, all these SaaS companies used to build their own clouds, They're building their own data centers. Chuck, you know, Chuck Phillips of, uh, of, of Infor says, I don't, I don't, friends don't let friends build data centers. <laughs> so uh, maybe he's prescient, maybe the trend is that these apps are going to largely, predominantly run in the public cloud. Oracle, IBM notwithstanding, they've got the resources to maybe you know, tough it out. Is that the scenario that you see? I am, like take the consumer companies, whether you take WeWork, Airbnb, Uber, mm -hmm. all these guys, you're already seeing them, to some opinion, maybe they have their own data center, but they're all vastly running on public clouds, yeah. right? And you've already seen that even the big SaaS vendors, whether it's Adobe, yep. Adobe is already partnering with Microsoft Azure, right. Workday is partnering with Amazon, you saw um, uh, uh, Salesforce partnering with Google Cloud and mm -hmm. AWS, so you're already seeing these vendors, the large SaaS vendors, already saying, you know what, for me, for economics wise, it doesn't make sense whether it's for my marketing cloud, my service cloud, my e-commerce cloud, I want this to run on this cloud platform to get scale, cost of economics, and also I need my services that are built there with a new substrate. Mm -hmm. Like we talked about whether it's Lambda functions to Kinesis, I'm not going to do it on my platform. But, and that trend is going on, it's, it's mm -hmm. just accelerating. So how are you spending your time these days? You, you've had a very successful entrepreneur, investor, you've been CEO of multiple companies, so, uh, what are you doing these days? I'm, look, uh, I'm very happy with what I'm doing right now. So I spend a lot of time with this company called Isara. Mm -hmm. the, right, I, you and me talked about it. It's a startup company in Palo Alto. Uh, their vision is to s apply, like what we taught, AI ops, applying AI for digital transformation, for AI customer service, IT RPA. So I like their vision. Look, I want to spend time with companies which are taking a big bet, right? It's like in our IT industry, nobody talks about moonshot goals. Let's take a bigger bet. Let's take a a much vision of four, five year, 10 years, what can we disrupt, right? And I look at those companies, I invest with those companies and spending time with them. I'm learning a lot in the process, I'm contributing back to the, those companies. Well, you know, it's I was on Twitter yesterday with a, with, a, with a little group, we were having an interesting discussion about you know, how things are changing, the dynamics of where innovation comes from. So we started this conversation with that sort of new innovation cocktail, and there just seems to be a whole new fabric of services. Not only, it's not just remote cloud services anymore, it's these embedded services that are, can think, they can act, they can sense, and it's ubiquitous, and then the edge, autonomous vehicles. We're entering a whole new era, it's very exciting. Right, and again, so one thing that we didn't talk about, my concern and my, again, it's society has to have regulations and will come. If you look at the, what's happened in this whole call center, customer service industry, mm. if autonomicity will happen of any level, from level, even if I automate 30% of your customer service, and you don't touch a human being when you are at home for your Comcast to your Nest. Imagine all those services inside your home from field service to, if they get automated, what's going to happen? First of all, your service is going to improve, your costs are going to reduce. If I'm a business, I can take that money and invest somewhere else. But more importantly, those most of those things, it's a, it's a big disruption happening in the outsource industry, mm -hmm. right? These are your jobs in China, India, Philippines, Vietnam. My concern is that, saying that there'll be a, a disruption is going to happen, people are not paying attention to that. And this, this train has already left the station. Yeah. It's going to come to a platform again, some next platform, but next four or five years, you'll see a tremendous disruption in this area of digital transformation. Well, I remember a couple decades ago, there was a lot of talk about, well, you, people spending a lot of money on IT, but the, you don't see it in the productivity numbers, and all of a sudden, because of the you know, PC revolution, the productivity went through the roof. You're hearing similar sort of discussions now. We feel like productivity is about to explode because of what you're saying here. Absolutely, and again, the back to the RPA has already shown the value. Yeah. RPA is no longer a niche category. It, as you said, we talked about successful vendors from UiPath, Automation Anywhere, Blue Prism. That's just on the back end of the supply chain and the RPA side. Taking that to front office, mm -hmm. applying that to customer service, facing to your CRM, facing that to your IT hasn't happened yet. Can I automate your tasks? Can I automate your actions? Right, from an employee experience to customer experience, that productivity, if you employ it, you'll get more customers doing that. Yeah, it scares people, but uh, but it's the future, so you better embrace it and lean in. Mudu, thanks so much. Always good Always to talk to you, Dave. Pleasure to see you, all right. Thanks Thank for watching, everybody. This is Dave Vellante from our studios in Palo Alto, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Dave.